Okay, welcome. Welcome, everyone. We've got a great group of folks in the audience. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. And for those of you um, who've been attending our webinars, uh, thanks for coming back. It's really nice to see a lot of uh, familiar um, names in the, the audience list. So for folks that I have not yet met, uh, my name is Sarah Switzer uh, and I work at the Center for Community-Based Research. In a moment, I'm going to be asking my co-facilitators to introduce themselves. Um, for those of you who, who are joining and require it, just to let you know that closed captioning is enabled and you can toggle it on and off at the bottom of your screen. So this webinar is part three in a four part series designed to build community-based evaluation capacity to advance the sustainable development goals. This is a partnered project between the Center for Community-Based Research and Conrad Grable University, which are both located, um, uh, which are both located on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee peoples, uh, the Anishinaabe, uh, the Neutral peoples, otherwise known as Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, and both CCBR and Conrad Grable University um, are located, our kind of homes are on the University of Waterloo campus, uh, which is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to six nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. So today and over the next month, uh, we have one more webinar left. Um, as we continue conversations about community-based evaluation and the sustainable development goals, we encourage us all to ask, all of us in the audience, sustainable for whom? What does sustainability entail? What are we working towards? Whose voices do the SDGs include? What do these frames eclipse? And where do we start our conversations? For example, in the spirit of reconciliation, um, we ask, you know, what does it mean to work towards the Canada 2030 agenda, um, while also ensuring that we're continually interrogating the relationship between the SDGs and the broader efforts of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission outlined in the calls to action. For those of you who might not be able to uh, have access to the, to the slides, if you're calling in or you can't um, uh, view the slides, on the screen is an image of a public art installation uh, called Red Embers, organized by the Native Women's Resource Center and led by Pamela Hart. Red Embers is envisioned and designed by an all-women team of designers, Indigenous artists, and it's a memorial to all Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit communities who have been lost and stolen. It is, a represent, it is also a representation of strength, resilience, and resistance. For those who might not be able to view the photo on the screen, there's four red stitched tapestries mounted on cedar posts that blow in the wind. In the backdrop are trees and behind the trees Lake Ontario. This particular installation is mounted in Ashbridge's Bay in Tuckeranto, it's covered by Treaty 13, where I'm personally zooming in from, and the photo was taken just a few weeks ago. And so today, you know, as we talk about localizing, as we talk about um, uh, larger conversations about ethics and um, methods and analysis and how do we engage stakeholders in, in meaningful dialogue around evaluation, um, we really need to, to remember and, and that, that localizing, you know, cannot take place without attending to the very specific socio-political, historical, and community-specific realities, needs, and resistance movements, importantly, right? And community-based actions that are happening on the ground, and that this work starts with work that you and the communities that you're working with are already doing, and how do we amplify that work? Given the national and possibly international uh, reach of the webinar, we recognize that many of you may be calling in from different locations and different relationships to, to places. And throughout today and, and next week when we meet again, we encourage you to make use of the chat box. Say hello. Let us know where you're calling in from. Let us know about the initiatives and the actions that are taking place in your own communities. Very quickly, some housekeeping um, details for today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted online on our website. In theory, it should only show the active speaker. However, please feel free to turn off your camera or change your name if you don't want this information captured. Uh, please keep your microphone off. For tech questions, you can reach out to Madeline. She's changed her name to For Tech in the chat. Um, and as mentioned, closed captioning is enabled um, and you can turn it on using the, the three dots on the bottom of the screen. And Madeline will also have you write that into chat as well. Okay, so some introductions. Um, very, very briefly, my name is Sarah Switzer. And as I mentioned before, um, I'm calling in from uh, the Center for Community-Based Research. And I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Rich. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Rich Jansen. I'm also from the Center for Community-Based Research. Good to see everybody here today. Jean? Yeah, thank you, Rich. Uh, my name is Jean Dodier Bassabose. I work for Center for Community-Based Research as a, as a researcher. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Thanks, Jean. My name is Paul Heidebrecht. I work at Conrad Grebel University College. Really glad to be a part of this project and this webinar. Pass it over to Madeline. Hi, everyone. I'm Madeline. I'm a student intern at the Center for Community Based Research and a graduate student at Conrad Grable College. And back to you, Sarah. I think you cut out there a little bit, uh, Madeline. Uh, Yusra, do you want to uh, join us uh, briefly to introduce yourself? For sure. Hi, my name is Yustra. I work with the Mothers Matter Center. We are a virtual national consortium of organizations that serve vulnerable and isolated women and their families. So we do a lot of gender-based programming and I'm here to talk to everyone and share our experience of an interesting approach that we took of uh, bottoms up uh, programming with, which is very community led. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Yusra. Um, we'll be hearing more from Yusra uh, in a little bit um, about uh, the Women's Insight Project, so stay tuned. And for all of you, please type into chat, tell us where you're calling in from, where your feet are planted. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, John, who's going to tell us a little bit about this project as a recap. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, that's it. For those who participated in uh... Uh, previous uh, webinars. This is a reminder about this this project. Uh, this is a, a partnered uh, project by Conrad Grebo University College and the Center for Community-Based Research. And the project is funded by the Employment and Social Development in Canada. Uh, this is uh, uh, this project is uh, an opportunity to engage uh, stakeholders in the reflective practices when working to eliminate violence and promote peaceful and equitable societies. It is an opportunity to build community-based evaluation capacity of organizations involved in advancing the SDGs with a focus on peace, gender equity, and education. The project is uh, part of a bigger agenda uh, to help Canada achieve its agenda for achieving the development, uh, the sustainable development goals by 2030. Uh, this project, in this project, we will be focusing on uh, uh, three SDGs, uh, SDG 5, uh, which is uh, about uh, gender equity, SDG 16, which uh, is about peace and uh, promoting peace and justice, and SDG 4, which is about uh, quality education. But all SDGs are welcome. Uh, maybe I will invite my colleague, uh, Madren, to send you just uh, uh, links so that you can uh, look at the target, the SDGs target into chat. Here is our objectives for today. We briefly recap on why this project and what uh, community-based evaluation is and why community-based evaluation is important. We are going to be focusing on how to gather and analyze information eth ethically when conducting community-based evaluation. This really will be the most a part of this uh, webinar. And uh, we will also have chance to hear from the Women's Insights Project, a local project using the community-based participatory approaches to localize the SDGs. Uh, let me just invite my colleague Rich to share a little bit about uh, community-based evaluation. Thanks, John. And again, this is a, a refresher for those of you who have been to, to the webinars before. 
um, uh, we just uh, unpack a little bit what do we mean by community-based evaluation before we uh, head on with the rest of the webinar. Um, so three homeworks, stakeholder-driven, participatory, and action-oriented. And this is connected to the localization of SDGs because, well, with stakeholder driven, you see there that it's the program or the interventions unique theory of change that drives the um, evaluation agenda. Yes, we can link to the SDG framework, um, but it is the unique local theory of change um, that is at the center of the evaluation. It's participatory. It asks who has a stake in this issue and it meaningfully involves um, those stakeholders throughout the evaluation process and it's action oriented which is similarly to thinking about community-based evaluation goals on the next slide, we can see that there are three of them. It is about learning together um, as, as, as a group, um, but it's more. It's also about communicating or sharing what we've learned um, and also building relationships, uh, stakeholder engagement, a very relational exercise um, that is uh, part of the community-based evaluation process. And then finally, um, how do you do it? Um, well, four phases um, and 11 non-linear steps. Um, laying the foundation was the focus of last webinar. We went through those four um, steps, ending with having a, an understanding together as a group of what the purpose of the evaluation is. There can be many purposes of evaluation. Um, what is your specific purpose that you agree on as a group um, together with your steering committee? And today we'll focus on phase two and phase three the evaluation planning, and then implementing that plan by gathering your information and analyzing the results. And next webinar, we'll focus on the fourth phase, um, the acting on the findings, and talk about the use of evaluation, not only doing evaluation, but also using the findings. And if you see, all four phases have both a relational and a technical um, uh, aspect to it, just an acknowledgement that throughout this, uh, for, uh, this cycle of four phases that we're always thinking about stakeholder engagement. And again, that's the connection to uh, localizing SDGs is engaging stakeholders who have um, uh, a stake in the issue under evaluation. So we call this our GPS. Um, and uh, today we will uh, focus on phase two and phase three. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Um... We are now ready for phase two, which is about evaluation planning. Like a lot of things, if you do things up front, uh, here I mean, uh, if you have laid uh, a strong foundation, it will save you uh, on the back end. In this section, we are going to, to walk uh, through determining the evaluation questions, uh, once you have established evaluation questions, this will lead to developing the methods for collecting information and developing a plan for how we will analyze data uh, that we correct or we have corrected. The, in the previous webinar, we talked about creating an evaluation process uh, state, uh, an, an evaluation purpose statement. Once you have that purpose, it naturally flows into your evaluation questions. And our uh, questions should be uh, at the end uh, or should be answered at the end of the evaluation. The main questions are, uh, are linked to the purpose. They are reflected. They are reflecting the interests of all stakeholders, and are open-ended. Oh, it depends on what you are looking for. But generally, they are open-ended. Uh, here we mean not yes or no questions. And also the main questions are related to process and outcomes of your evaluation. Sarah, I think I, I need to pass it to you for the uh, following uh, conversation. Thanks so much, John. 
one thing it may be helpful to kind of think about as you're developing your, your main evaluations questions, and, and John alluded this uh, a little bit, um, because they're linked to the purpose, um, at the end, you know, uh, you really want to think like, can these questions be feasibly answered, right? Um, uh, and, and how importantly, how do they reflect the interests of all the different uh, stakeholders? So that's kind of the key, key piece here. Uh, and refining uh, and developing questions are no easy feat. So it, it will take you a little bit of time. And this, this stage is really quite crucial to any evaluation process. So once you have your questions, you can start to think about what are the, the best um, methods you, to use to um, uh, answer them. But before you do that, it's really critical to look at existing data before you get too far into the weeds of collecting new information. So we always ask, what are you, what information um, have you already collected within your organization or within your startup or within your project? Sometimes you might already have a lot of the data that you need. And so looking at that existing material first can be really helpful. And this is particularly important if you're also working with communities who have been over-researched or um, over, you know, are, are involved in a lot of evaluation efforts um, to really make sure you're, you're working with folks' um, experiences and knowledges wisely. And you're really asking here, does the data help answer your main evaluation questions? All right. Now, if your organization um, uh, needs more uh, uh, data, needs more information, then you start can start to think about are there gaps in the information needed, what new data is needed, um, and how do you work with the steering committee to develop appropriate methods. All right. And again, this is linked to your purpose statement and your questions. There's a natural flow through here. So there's lots of different types of methods. Methods they all do different things and they provide different tools or different avenues for looking at data. There are pros and cons to using each method. Um, and we could have an entire webinar on each one <laughs> of these methods. So this is gonna be very, very quick. Um, in short, we can think about um, methods falling into two buckets. We've got qualitative methods that are about capturing stories or subjective experiences. Um, it's not about, you know, did you do this thing? Um, but how, how did you, how did you experience your involvement in a program? Qualitative methods at the end, it's about the meaning that people make out of their experience. And it's often, they're often really good for um, uh, assessing depth and, uh, or, or sorry, for depth. So you go deep with qualitative methods and also for getting at context, right? Context is key. So we can think about qualitative methods um, as such as individual interviews, focus groups, um, forums, or kind of workshops that are structured in a, in a, in a, in a way that solicit responses from folks, participant observation, arts-based methods, and there are always new methods that are being developed, okay? On the other side, we've got quantitative um, methods. So in contrast to qualitative methods, quantitative methods are often really good for breadth of understanding, right? You can um, uh, reach multiple, 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 multiple people with a survey, whereas with interviews, you're going to be consulting with fewer people. Uh, qualitative, sorry, quantitative methods are concerned with measurement and numbers, and it can be still about experience, but here the words are assigned to a number like in a scale. Right. Quantitative methods are not about meaning per se. Um, uh, they're really getting kind of a snapshot um, of, our, of experience here. And so we can think about surveys, informal questionnaires, census data, large data sets, intake forms. Um, and again, there are other other methods here. Uh, and, and finally, we can think about literature reviews. Literature reviews in a way is about um, assessing data that's already out there, but it might be data that other folks and other teams have collected. Uh, and they really assess what is already known in a field about an issue, strength, or problem. And a literature review can cover both quantitative and qualitative studies. And you'll note that you don't have to pick one or the other. There's lots of evaluation plans that are mixed methods and that use both. And at the end, you want to really think again, who is collecting and analyzing the data. Uh, we could have a whole other conversation about including peer researchers or community researchers, which a lot of community-based approaches do. And uh, I know our, uh, we'll be hearing a little, little later from the Mothers Matters Project, who will tell us a little bit about that. And again, data can be primary, new, or secondary, pre-existing. And as I mentioned, it's best to use multiple methods from multiple perspectives. Finally, a few quick things around design. You also want to consider what methods will you use to answer your main evaluation questions, as I mentioned. Uh, what are the best ways to answer your evaluation questions and to importantly capture different stakeholder perspectives, right? 
how do your methods work together to answer the main evaluation questions, you know, and how do they work together? They might be better together than if they were conducted alone. In what order or stages should the methods be carried out? Maybe you start with a survey and go broad, and then from there interview um, a few folks that um, uh, filled out the survey that are interested in providing more in-depth qualitative um, uh, commentary on their experience. And finally, how are these methods requiring you to recruit participants? How will you select people to be involved? So this is sampling. How will you go about recruiting people? And again, as we talked about last week, the steering committee is going to be involved in all of these different stages. And so you'll be um, really vetting a lot of these decisions from them. And perhaps you'll be working with um, folks within your community and training folks uh, and learning alongside them to collect some of this information or do some of this recruitment. And I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, Rich. Yeah, so step three in this phase, it's uh, good to think ahead about how you will handle the data that you will collect. We'll talk more about data analysis later on in the webinar. Um, but after you've developed your methods, just stop and pause uh, before starting to gather the data. Step up on the balcony uh, for a moment and just imagine what you would do with all those words and numbers and images um, that, that you're collecting. Doing this helps you discover where you have holes or gaps in your plan. And part of this goes back to the data being collected and asking the question, is this data really answering my research questions? Is it answering our main purpose that we have established for the evaluation? And thinking about the analysis plan also helps to keep you on budget and timeline. And so here's some more final tips around the, the analysis plan. Um, this is not the time to, to panic and think you got it all wrong. Trust yourself, your original design in the questions, um, your being the collective you, um, that uh, you've had conversations about purpose and, and main research questions and methods um, and uh, uh, have some confidence in that. Think ahead about who is going to do the ana data analysis. Sometimes uh, groups need outside help for this um, data analysis. Sometimes they have internal capacity, but think it through, particularly for qualitative uh, data, which is a bit more time consuming in the analysis, um, make sure that you uh, leave enough time and flexibility um, for reflection and, and that meaning making process. Of course, you're always looking at your main research questions or evaluation questions and uh, making sure that uh, that becomes the focus um, of your data analysis plan and using your steering committee um, to, to think through with you about the soundness of your analysis plan. We'll have Yusra in, in a moment give a, an example of um, this phase, phase two, um, in, in her organization. But just uh, linking back to our previous webinar, we talked about the Working Together project here in Waterloo. Um, it's a, a project that's uh, for refugee newcomers with uh, language training um, in the workplace. Last time we showed you the logic model, if you remember version 17, it's a developmental evaluation um, um, over, th over three years. Here are the three main um, evaluation questions that they uh, came up with as a, as a steering committee. To what extent is the project effective in, in planning and implementation? So a very open-ended process question. And then an outcome question about um, whether it's reaching the intended outcomes of, uh, on clients and, and the broader community. And then uh, because it was a developmental evaluation and really um, uh, building the program as they were going, because there weren't a lot of models out there uh, about this, how can the program and its theory of change be, be better improved um, to facilitate employment of, of refugee newcomer clients? And in answering those questions, um, there were seven methods. And all of these methods uh, we did three times in three annual cycles, so those four phases. We went around three times. Every year we went around um, and uh, these methods were, were, were used. We tweaked them um, over, over time. But you can see on the top, all of those methods have, have refugee newcomer clients as their focus. So whether that be tracking, the organization reception house tracked um, all, the, all the outputs, all the things, the activities um, that the program did. Every touch of the program on a refugee's life was tracked um, uh, over time on a spreadsheet. And then there were three, um, uh, three other methods. Um, we had in-depth case studies uh, where three, uh, three um, um, people or a number of people, um, refugee clients were, were identified as, as, uh, as stories um, and interviewing them and then two other people around them. So three interviews for each of the, each of the stories. And then we had a 
client survey. So this was the quantitative method. Um, uh, we did this on a longitudinal design, so baseline, and then every six months uh, later after they were in the program. So some clients did up to two years of, of uh, surveys and then focus group with clients. And those methods two, three, and four, those were done by peer researchers. So um, people who were uh, refugee newcomers in the past um, and who were trained and, and, and involved over three years on the research team. And on the bottom, you could see other methods from uh, staff focus groups, all the, all the partners who were involved. We also had annual focus groups, and then we had that literature review or secondary document review. So this is an example of that mantra that uh, Sarah talked about, multiple methods multiple perspectives. That's where you get your rigor in community-based evaluation. I'm not putting your eggs in any one of these baskets, but each has a limitation, each has strengths, and triangulating on what you're learning across stakeholders and, and by different methods. Thanks, Rich. So that's a bit of a, a snapshot, and we're about to get um, a second, or hear from a, a, you start with a second case study, uh, a little bit more in depth. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, in a moment, I uh, have the pleasure of introducing Yusra uh, Kudir, who's gonna be telling us a little bit about the Women's Insight Project, and I'm gonna uh, read out Yusra's bio here. So Yusra has been working on projects that empower vulnerable and marginalized groups for over 12 years. She brings experience of working with various international civil society organizations and the United, Development, United Nations Development Program to this work. Um, She's done a lot of work mainstreaming uh, with mainstreaming processes, um, uh, with uh, other with marginalized communities, uh, governance processes, working on meaningful social inclusion and evidence-based advocacy. Um, uh, many of these are her primary interests. Yusha has worked with communities in Asia and Africa at the grassroots level and is now working as the director of innovations, advocacy, and multicultural hippie at the Mothers Matter Center. The Mothers Matter Center is a virtual national consortium of organizations dedicated to serving socially isolated and low, uh, low economic status mothers and their families using its proven mothers to mother approach. The mission of Mothers Matter Center is to empower mothers to develop the knowledge and capacity they need to take control of their futures and become effective parents and engaged citizens. And Yusha oversees the Mothers Matters um, Women's Insight Project, which is a community led initiative that builds the capacity of vulnerable women and puts them in the driving seat to lead the change they want to see in their communities. Uh, and is doing really, really incredible work around kind of participatory processes and the SDGs. And so I'm so delighted, Yusra, um, that uh, you're here to speak today. So I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, I'm going to start if I'm going to take 10. Uh, be before I start the presentation, I just want to say that it's, it's brilliant, you know, listening to uh, what colleagues just, you know, said practical tools and things that are to do's within um, the evaluation domain. My presentation is going to be more about our project and what it looks like. So for evaluators, it may not be any guidance as to how you will uh, evaluate, but it can give you an example of a project that is very community based that has the participatory action approach. And then you may think about, you know, how, how you'd evaluate a project like this. Um, okay, so thank you for uh, the introduction, Sarah. I just want to acknowledge that the Mother's Matter Center's central offices are located on the ancestral and traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the Slavertooth, Quiquitlam, Squamish, and the Musqueam nations. So I want to talk a little bit about the organization. As Sarah said, we're a virtual national consortium of organizations dedicated to serving socially isolated and low economic status mothers and their families. And we use our unique mother to mother approach. So it's a very peer um, approach based model that we used. Uh, that we've always used, we don't see ourselves as going into the community as someone who is uh, working to uplift communities, but we always say that we're working with the families, with the women on the ground through our amazing partners across the country to facilitate and help the community create the change that they want to see. So we work with uh, communities to break the cycle of isolation and then see uh, where they want to go um, 
and there's a lot of addressing inequalities and the communities come together to support each other. And our all our projects are very community centered. So this has been called a variety of things in the past. It was a rights-based approach and then the human centered approach and community centrality. But we really want to make sure that the communities are a partner in the project and that's how uh, we can create change. So the organization has been around for over 22 years and it has touched lives across Canada. The Women's Insight Project is a unique project. It is also funded through the ESDC, so Economic and Social Development Canada. Uh, and it was on the Sustainable Development Goals. It's the only project of its nature funded through this round of funding that is doing work at the community level that's bringing vulnerable, isolated communities at grassroots uh, in a position or giving it, those communities really the driving seat to lead the change in their communities. So it's a very flexible uh, project. It's for three years. The three partners are ISS of BC, uh, the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Centre Society and the Al Mustafa Foundation Academy Society. So each of these partners work with one woman group in their communities. So ISS of BC is working with a refugee and newcomer women's group. The Friendship Centre is working with a group of Indigenous women and the Al Mustafa Foundation is working with a group of Muslim immigrant uh, women. Uh, all the partners are located in the lower mainland in British Columbia. And this is a pilot project where we are testing out a gender-based and community-led participatory action uh, approach where we are building the capacity of these communities and we will see if we can come up with a model that can be replicated or scaled. Uh, so in terms of the project model, I'll just quickly tell you what it looks like. So the first pillar in the project is about tooling up. So we we wanted to develop tools that were replicable that could be used with communities that may have low literacy, low English language uh, abilities, or uh, you know, just have some hands-on tools to make sure that the community has the support that they need in terms of uh, capacity. So we developed four modules and I'll share with you the details about those modules. Uh, the one module is on sustainable development goals. There's another on power theory and practice. There's one on applied power and there's one on policy and program design. So once we had the tools, we used a train the trainer approach where each of the partners recruited a community facilitator and we, the MMC trained those community facilitators. And these community facilitators went out and recruited the women groups uh, within their communities. Um, and then there's the component of capacity building of the communities. So the community facilitators that are now trained are doing work, learn trainings with the communities. So they would train the community for you know two hours one week and next week for two hours the community uh, the women in the group would go out into their communities do observation engage with the community come back with learning experiences report back they learn something new and next week they go uh, do some more work so that's the way uh, we're getting women at the community level to do a community-based needs assessment and then design uh, a project on some of the barriers that they feel uh, need to be addressed within their communities. And it has been an interesting process. The women in the communities have been amazing as have the facilitators and our partners, but it, it is a bumpy ride, making sure all the stakeholders are engaged, making sure the women are available. These women are already, you know, they, they have their set of barriers and challenges, but their motivation and commitment has been amazing. Don't ask me the trouble we had in negotiating uh, the contract because uh, it's difficult to say when you're doing a community-based participatory action project and you need to say, okay, which SDGs are you going to hit? And we're like, you know, we don't know. The community will decide. So how long will the project be? We don't know. The community will decide. But uh, it has been figured out and we are documenting the model so it can help others. And then, of course, it's creating a scalable resource, re resource based on what we learn and what we see in the project. So I we developed those 
four modules for capacity building of the community with very hands-on techniques. So, you know, lots of watching videos, lots of going out uh, in the community and doing simple exercises and getting a lot of practice in. These resources are available on our website. The web address is here. I can paste it in the chat later. If somebody wants to access it, you can uh, use these materials uh, if you like. What we are learning is that inequality is real. It's one thing talking about it in a community of practice setting. It is something else when the communities, the women at the communities have actually talked about it based on their experience and their challenges that uh, they face every day. And of course, based on the challenges, it's we need intersectional approaches because every group on the ground is unique and the needs are really diverse and one approach that works for one group does not work for another and you cannot just work on one thing with uh, communities because you know it's, it's a system that they're operating within and changes need to uh, be intersectional as do approaches. COVID-19 had some implications, some communities were disproportionately impacted and the climb out is also not as smooth like okay the cases are going down things are normal it's it is complicated when you're at the grassroots we learned that experiential hands-on learning works with communities where the communities can actively do things they can practice approaches uh, and they don't just sit and watch a video on what a participatory action uh, research or a community-led project is it's little activities that get them to practice the smaller elements that form these bigger concepts that we talk about uh, we, we've also learned that flexibility and innovation is really key. If we are not flexible and if we are not innovative, we cannot really enable communities to do things and realize their full potential. So if we are able to make little tweaks and some adjustments, it really helps the projects and the communities. Uh, we also learned that engaging all stakeholders is essential. Um, so if we're working with women, we're not just engaging women, we're engaging men and boys and uh, community leaders, elders, other people in the, in the community. And that's something that we keep coming back again and again with the women. Um, we realized that digital technology, it is a great opportunity and it can also be a barrier. So depending upon the unique context of the communities, uh, we are learning that and we're making the approaches that uh, we're making the tweaks that we need to in our approaches to make sure that we use it for its benefits and we're not limited by uh, the tech especially after the covid pandemic we're also learning that evaluations add most value when they are empowering for communities so our our external external evaluator would come in and always say that well you know think of me as a critical friend and what we and and it's it's a very open and safe environment that's created for the facilitators for the partners for the communities to share their learning and that really help when people realize that the evaluator is not a monitor who's coming with the stick and is going to tell you what you're doing wrong so i think that's that's really important um, the high level evaluation questions that we have for our project are here up on the screen. So we are really looking at, uh, you know, how the project contributes to building and strengthening relations between uh, our organization and other project collaborators, because, you know, the partnership element is really important. So that's what we focused on during the first year of the project when we were not doing a lot of work with the community but we were tooling up and developing the partnerships that we need to roll out the project and then we want to see what difference did the project make so we want to see how the woman transformed how the relationships worked at the community level how how did change really happen if it happened and if it didn't happen uh, what were some of the barriers what evidence do we have on goals achieved in the short and medium term and this would vary from group to group context to context and then what key lessons did we learn from planning and implementing this innovation and this would guide us document the model effectively so that it can be it can be used by other communities and other organizations so i just um i just want to say that 
In terms of the sustainable development goals and where each community is, we talk a lot about leaving nobody behind and communities that are isolated and vulnerable. So we need to be very careful when we think about the SDGs and we think about the changes that we are looking for because, you know, where are we coming from in seeing that, okay, who is left behind? What does being left behind mean? What does that entail? Because every community, every individual is coming from a different context and a unique position. So any progress that a certain community has made, it can be very relative and it's not always black and white. So the qualitative data that evaluations uh, look for and supply is really important for projects like ours. And I assume uh, work for the community that we operate in. So I really appreciate uh, Rich and Sarah and Jan when you had the, you know, having open-ended questions and, um, you know, the process and going through the process again and again on the screen. I just want to take five seconds to acknowledge that I was very pleasantly surprised to see our external evaluator also on the call. This was not pre-planned, but I just want to give a shout out to Angela, uh, who's on the call, and she is uh, doing some great work on our project evaluating it. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Sarah, and if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Yusra. That was, was such a fantastic um, presentation and, and explan uh, explanation of, of the work that you're doing. I think it's so, um, it really came at the right time because it grounds so much that we are talking about in webinar one uh, and two and, and, and three, and really thinking about what does it mean to do community-based research or community-based evaluation um, with um, communities on the ground, making sure we're remaining flexible, um, responsive, adaptive, really taking that intersectional approach, attending to power dynamics um, uh, and ensuring that, um, you know, uh, folks on the ground are really driving the conversation around the SDGs. So I'm, I'm so appreciative of you for you sharing today. We're going to take questions, but we're going to take questions at the end, um, uh, if that's okay. All right. I'm just going to share my screen again, just a moment. Nice. Terrific. And just to, 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 to make a note, one of the things that Rich shared in, in chat was that the, the example that you shared, uh, Yusra, in terms of the, the Women's Insight Project is such a good example of a needs assessment that develops new interventions in a really bottom-up way. Uh, and once established, we can think um, of these interventions as then using a community-based uh, approach to evaluation. So that may help folks um, uh, see uh, uh, the work that Yusra presented within a larger, uh, larger picture. So I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, John, who's going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and thank you, uh, Yusra, for very inspiring presentation on your case studies. Uh, uh, what is the next? Now we are moving to phase three, uh, which is about information gathering and analysis. An evaluation is only as good as the information you gather and how you use it. You need to think deeply at the end, at the outset about how we can use evaluative information for learning. Now that we have plan, we move to implementing the plan in phase three. Having a plan is uh, integral to the data gathering phase. Once you have created a data gathering plan, ensure that data is being gathered according to that plan. And ensure that people are trained adequately to gather data and work with specific population. It is important to organize regular meetings with a steering committee to reflect on data corrections process, issues, and learnings. And uh, also it is important to conduct pilot tests uh, before your main tests. 
ethical also ethical consideration is also important and Sarah will talk more about this. Uh, ethical is considered, make sure that ethic is considered and uh, followed. It is important to ensure that the plan is uh, adaptable uh, where necessary. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I pass it over to you. Thanks, John. So um, when we think about ethics and evaluation, ethics is something that, you know, we're, we're talking about it in webinar three, but it really like it starts from the very, very beginning to think about um, uh, how we ensure that the work that we do is community responsive, relevant, meaningful. And we're really thinking about kind of different eth ethical issues that might inform the work in the planning. All right. So just to know that it does kind of follow through at all different stages. So at the end of the day, risk is a bit inevitable when it comes to research and evaluation. Ethics is about making sure that we do our very, very best to mitigate harm and importantly, and this is central, add benefit, right? We, we were doing work so that it increases benefit at both the individual and the community level. One way of doing this is thinking about informed consent. Um, so ensuring that folks understand what they are agreeing to um, and that they can you know, walk away or withdraw at any time without any consequences. You know, or, or, or do they fully know what is involved? Um, and we can think about um, uh, informed consent through the language of free, prior uh, and voluntary consent here. Another thing to think about is how do we um, reduce harm, you know, for folks um, that are involved, especially for those who might be uh, historically marginalized. Um, how do we think through who is going to be accessing the data, um, to ensuring that the data remains confidential, and importantly, really recognizing power dynamics or conflicts of interest um, throughout the process, as, as Yushra um, alluded to uh, in her presentation. You know, there's really um, uh, we have to take a really intersectional approach to thinking about who's who's in the room and how do we um, design evaluation uh, processes accordingly. How do we think about ownership? How do we think about where the information that's being collected, like how is it gonna be shared back to the community as we're gonna be talking about next week? So in the interest of time, um, oops, I'm not gonna share this first. I'm gonna ask folks to type into chat really quickly. What are some of the ethical issues that you um, might uh, find yourselves considering in your own projects? What are some of the ethical issues that you might consider uh, when designing your own projects? Just type into chat for a few minutes here. We are gonna do a larger interactive activity, but I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Okay, so data protections, yeah. Making sure that things are stored, um, uh, not on an, in an organization uh, network where everyone has access, right? Like, you know, where, where does the data get stored for sure? Data protection, yeah, especially in the world where everything is online and things are flying back and forth with email. What are ethical issues that folks, power dynamics, perceived or direct? Yeah, absolutely. When we're working on these multi-stakeholder projects, you may have lots of different folks in the room um, uh, that have uh, very real uh, power dynamics at play. Ah, okay, potentially re-traumatizing folks or having uh, folks exposed to secondary trauma. Yeah, we're talking about SDGs um, 16, 5, and 4 here when we're talking about conflict, when we're talking about gender-based violence, when we're talking about um, issues that are really sensitive, it can be really difficult to share those stories and how do we ensure that folks aren't re-traumatized in the telling of the stories. And this is where the steering committee is essential for making sure that the questions are asked with care. Yeah, systemic biases. Yeah, power is always in the room. We can't get rid of power, right? Power dynamics are always there. So how do we mitigate them? And I also see someone posted sharing back to those that participated and that's central. We'll be talking about that next week, making sure that um, the data that's gathered doesn't sit on a shelf. And I also see other folks posted in the chat, power dynamics, ensuring participation is voluntary. That's really important if you're running a program and folks are currently participating in that program that they know that it doesn't have any impact on um, their involvement in the program or their care, if they're working in a, uh, they're involved in a social service organization. And one thing to note with informed consent, it often happens throughout the process, right? There might be a documentation process, but really ensuring that folks know um, about their right to withdrawal and withdraw and how the information is used. And that's an often an ongoing conversation. 
So many of you identified um, uh, many of the things already on the list here. So I won't read this all out, but just to, to signal that building relations of trust and, and mutual accountability are absolutely central. Um, ensuring safety, ensuring a trauma-informed approach, thinking about power, literacy, language barriers, health issues, legal status, conflict um, in communities that uh, may exist. Um, you know, folks may be unfamiliar or uncomfortable with uh, research and consent procedures, making sure that, you know, uh, we're, we're taking deep care with folks' stories that they're entrusting us with, um, and, and mistrust of evaluators, um, which can be really real. Now, there are different mechanisms for attending to ethical issues up front. You can inter uh, in, um, integrate community researcher roles into your team. Your steering committee is absolutely going to be essential, right, to, to helping you think through all of these ethical issues in the planning and then attend to the issues as they come up. Um, and you can also go through a formal ethics review process um, as, a, as a check and balance system. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with CREO, and I'm, in a moment I'm going to have Madeline put a link um, in the chat, and there's a link on the screen as well. This is the Community Research Ethics Office. Uh, CREO does ethical review for community-based research and evaluation. And you do not need to be affiliated with a university to go through CREO. So you can send your ethics application in through them. And it's comprised of a team of both academic and community um, researchers and evaluators who will help you think through some of the ethical issues up front with respect to uh, respect for persons, welfare and justice, which are covered by the tri Council, and importantly, respect for community. All right, so I'm going to pass it off to Rich, who's going to give us a bit of a speed tutorial on an analysis, knowing that this is a, a starting conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, data analysis in one slide and in one minute. So I won't say too much, but uh, generally there's two approaches to, to data analysis, depending on what kind of data you have. So if you have qualitative data, your, your words or, or, or images, uh, you try to make sense of, of them um, uh, using different types of analysis, including uh, thematic analysis. Um, and that's a very different process than if you have numbers, um, where you need to, to look for patterns in those numbers, um, whether one variable at a time or you're comparing two or, or multivariate, um, where you, you do statistical tests on your, on your, on your data. Either way, um, you're guided by your main research questions. That's what you're looking answers for, whether you have numbers or we have words. Um, what does each method say in answering those questions? And also looking at what are any similarities or different differences across stakeholder groups and how they answer those main research questions. So that's the analysis part. And then when you've done that method by method analysis, um, uh, you, you need to summarize across your methods and across stakeholder groups. So across all methods, what's the, what are the answers to the main research questions? Um, and across all stakeholders, what are the um, what are the answers to the main research questions? And that's what the summary report and next um, uh, webinar will talk more about uh, writing and, and report writing and other ways to communicate findings. Um, but the summary is across methods and across stakeholders. The next slide just shows um, the importance of that arrow that goes back from uh, phase three, the blue, um, to phase two, the gray. Um, that feedback loop says that we are working in communities and communities are dynamic and they're fluid. Um, they change. Um, and it's okay to change uh, your plan that you had um, in, in your methods or data analysis based on the changing circumstances. So an obvious example of, of, of a change has been the pandemic. A lot of our um, evaluations at CCBR, we needed to do that, that arrow back to phase two when uh, the pandemic hit and we had to adapt in how we gathered information um, and even adapt in uh, um, questions uh, that we wanted answered because now all of a sudden there was a, a large societal impact on the program. And so a lot of evaluations added a question about what are we learning in adaptation about the, the, the virtual reality? So that's okay to adapt. And it's actually a strength of your community-based evaluation if you're attuned to the changing circumstances of your community. And so there we are back to our GPS um, as you know, ending off um, the content of, of this webinar. Um, we covered the uh, three steps in evaluation planning um, and the two steps in the information gathering, um, all as a part of doing the evaluation. And next time we'll cover more about how to use the results in acting on our findings. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, so we don't have too much um, 
time left. Um, but in order to make sure that we have a little bit of time for, for some Q&A, um, maybe we'll, we'll extend for about five minutes. And for folks that have to jump off, um, that's OK. Um, we're going to take questions here for, for uh, our team at the Center for Community-Based Research, as well as if there's any questions for Paul with the, at Conrad Grable um, with the Center for Peace Advancement, as well as questions for, Yus for Yusra with uh, women's, uh, the Women's Insight Project. So um, I invite folks to type into into chat any questions that they have and uh, we'll take it from there. And maybe as you're typing, I saw there was a question you saw for you earlier. I'm just going to scroll up here. Um, uh, Bashir asked, did you uh, use SDG best practices from other local and international efforts um, in your project design uh, and in establishing your goals and objectives? Okay, that's that. That's a great uh, question. I think when we were handing in the proposal, so the United Nations um, does uh, did a mapping of good practices on the SDGs, and they they had released the first publication of that, and I, I believe the second one is out now. It came out in February. We looked through some of those and. Um, the work on SDGs in the developed world and in the developing world looks very different. So a lot of work with, uh, that was identified for the Americas was, um, uh, you know, in Brazil or in Mexico and not so much um, in Canada. And whatever was happening in, in the US was more like, you know, seminars and awareness raising, but not a lot of community based work and actions. So the goals and objectives of our projects were to, you know, to build the capacity to support communities to to document to 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 document the pilot project and we left the specific goals at community level to the women for when they had the capacity to make up their own goals, their own objectives and work towards that. Thank you so much, Yusra. I think that also really speaks and anchors to what we've been talking about throughout this webinar series as around starting with what the work that you're already doing, starting with the with the issues that are that are most pressing to the communities that you're working with as this bottom up approach, rather than um, looking at the looking to the SDG indicators first. Uh, Yusra, there's another question for you in the chat by Randy. Um, Randy asks, could you speak uh, could you speak to what you mean by SDG gaps? For sure, I think that's an important question because when we uh, recruited women to the project and we we're talking about SDGs, they were like, "What's this? What is this?" Like, when when you when you can't access essential services and you have basic needs that need uh, that need to be met, like they they don't care what we call these goals, whether it's SDGs or something else. So. So these are basically so any it's it's quite ironic actually because the needs of the communities and the actual communities that are driving uh, the whole agenda 2030 and the sustainable development goals they don't see themselves as a picture or they don't see themselves as an actor in the bigger larger scheme of things so by SDG gaps in our projects what we specifically mean is that issues uh, that these communities are facing. So these women, the issues that they are facing that they would want to address at the communal or local level. And we know, and, and you know, we can write it up well and we can build their capacity to see how that links with the SDGs. Thanks so much, Yusra. Oh, and one more question for you. Uh, where do you access the SDG uh, reports that you uh, you mentioned? Sure. So um, here I, I put a link in the chat for the first one, and I am going to put in the chat the link for the second one here. So there's two reports, uh, and they are put together. They're called SDG Good Practices, and they're put together by the UN's Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Terrific. Thank you so much. I think the other thing that you, you spoke to so well, Yusra, was that like community capacity building piece, right? Like how do we how do we do that translation work? Um, how do we shift up um, some of the indicators and the targets so they're relevant to the communities that we're working with? Uh, and so often when we're thinking about indicators and outcomes, it moves to like the quantitative, but you know, this can also be people's stories and experiences and um, use art space practices. There can be experiential work that's happening. You know, there's so many different opportunities here. 
All right, so I see one more question and then we'll maybe close up. Uh, oh, and thank you, Yusra, for, for putting the link to uh, uh, the Mothers Matter Women's uh, Insight Project in chat. We'll also share it out with folks um, uh, by email and it is also linked on our website. So one final question uh, from Mohammed. Um, any theme, uh, this is a question for uh, CCBR, although any of us can, can weigh in on this. Are there any thematic analysis guides that you would recommend? Anyone else from the CCBR want to take this? Offhand, I don't have any, like, like a link that I can throw into the chat. Um, in textbooks, yeah. <laughs> um, in popular um, uh, handbooks, uh, probably not. Um, the one that you might want to check out, though, as, as I say, that we did build a website for, for youth-led research um, um, in, in a project that we did in Haiti, and then it does have some um, thematic analysis in, in, in there. Um, so if you go to the CCBR website, maybe Madeline can throw that into the chat on our homepage, you'll see a slider that has a youth-led re research uh, toolkit. Um, and if you go onto that website, um, and, and if you look under phase three, which is data analysis, um, you, you'll probably find some um, uh, resources around thematic analysis as well. That's a great question. Uh, Mo and other folks can can uh, put links into chat if you know of any off the top of my head some of the ones that I can recommend um, some of these are quite academic I, I will admit you know we need more community based accessible resources um, but uh, there uh, there's a scholar Johnny uh, Saldana um, has a, a book on coding um, and I can certainly send it to folks afterwards I, I don't have the full reference off the top of my head but you could google it and there's lots of like if you google it you'll find lots of variations of kind of pdfs of circulating on the re on the internet um, and it's quite quite useful and it, uh, he really breaks down like how do you code um, data thematically, what do you need to do step by step. Um, and then on a counter to that, um, there's a really amazing uh, article out there by uh, Dr. Eve Tuck, um, who's an Indigenous community-based researcher, who talks a little bit about some of the problematics of coding and thematic analysis and how do we ensure um, that um, uh, we're looking at data kind of holistically and, and story holistically and that um, uh, and, and some of the, the pitfalls or problematics there and I can send that out as well. Uh, and then in terms of community based resources, um, I believe um, uh, SFU, um, their, their center called CERI, C-E-R-I, um, I believe the Community Engagement Research Initiative is how it uh, is, is the full acronym. They've got a guide online um, called uh, uh, to Community Engaged Research that has some pretty good um, resources. And then another guide um, uh, that was developed many, many, many years ago by Access Alliance Multicultural Health Services. Uh, they also have a CBR guide with some uh, pretty like um, uh, accessible resources that you can use to train uh, community researchers and whatnot in your, your organization. So lots of different things to choose from. And as Rich mentioned, uh, there's enormous amounts of resources on the CCBR website as well uh, around the youth led toolkit um, and other resources that we have. All right, so we are at time. In fact, we are over time. So thanks for folks for staying on. Um, a big uh, thank you uh, to, to Yusra for joining us today and sharing um, such an inspiring example of the work you're doing um, out west. Like it, like uh, it really grounds everything that we're talking about. Um, we have one more webinar, so please come out um, for our final webinar. Madeline, pop the link into chat. Uh, check out our website, uh, and if you've got good resources, send them our way. For those of you who've been here before have seen this standard, but uh, webinars are all online. Reach out if you have some support and thank you so much. We really hope to see you next week. Big, big, big thank you to everyone uh, and we'll see you soon. Have a great afternoon or morning, depending on where you're calling in from.